Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Wonderful. Um, my name is Anna Flurky Scheid, and I'm an ethicist on the faculty of the Theology and Religious Studies Department here at Duquesne, and I'm the director of this 14th annual Holy Spirit Lecture and Colloquium. Um, I will introduce Provost Dowsey to welcome you all in just a moment, but first I would like to invite Linda Donovan, our campus minister, one of our campus ministers, to the podium to begin with an invocation. And I also want to celebrate that this is the first time that a lay leader and a woman has led the invocation for the Holy Spirit Lecture. As we enter into prayer, I invite you to contemplate the deep silence before the chaos of creation and the movement of God's spirit. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now the earth was a formless void. There was darkness over the deep and God's spirit hovered over the water. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. Holy Spirit, settle powerfully yet peacefully on each of us. Breathe your life into us. Breathe wisdom in our words and actions. Teach us to listen and to be open. Help us to pray in truth and speak in love. Holy Spirit, comfort us. Quiet our anxieties and fill us with peace. Lead us from our darkness into the light. Holy Spirit, be our source of discernment. Renew our vision, our hope, and our faith. Restore us to the joy of your salvation and grant us a willing spirit to sustain us. Amen. Thank you for that beautiful invocation, Linda. And now I invite our provost, David Dowsey, to come to the podium and welcome you all. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my honor to welcome all of you here to Duquesne University as we celebrate the 14th annual Holy Spirit Lecture. This lecture is an expression of Duquesne's mission and charism as a university founded by the Congregation of the Holy Spirit, known, of course, as the Spiritans. For more than 300 years, the Spiritans have been guided by the Holy Spirit to touch the lives of countless people around the world. Spirit and founder Francis Lieberman said, O oh, divine spirit, I want to be before you like a light feather so that your breath may carry me where it will and I will not offer the least resistance to it. As we enter into prayer and reflection to receive today's lecture and panel, I encourage all of us to be that feather. Doing so requires for us to free our minds of our busy day and our obligations that await us when we are return to our lives later this evening. The Holy Spirit led the Spiritans to found Duquesne University 143 years ago as part of their commitment to serving the underserved immigrant poor in Pittsburgh. Through them, the Spirit gave life and hope to a community bereft with despair that accompanied the disorienting impact of industrialization on the urban poor. This was an extension of their ministry to the poor and to their commitment to the community and walking alongside others in the community rather than directing them from the front. Father Don Nesty, the president of Duquesne University from 1980 to 1987, and a current spirit and leader wrote, the life of the congregation both in its community 
and ministerial dimensions was to reflect the life of God who is communio. As a congregation of the Holy Spirit, it would place particular emphasis on God's ongoing transformative power and action as spirit. But it is in the life of communion, both within its vowed life and in its ministry of the poor, that the oneness of the triune God would be most understood by a world that awaits the good news that God is love. An emphasis on God's ongoing transformative power and action as spirit. Those are powerful words as we embark together as a community to embrace the Holy Spirit. I'd like to conclude my remarks with a quote from Romans 15, 13, that I hope will remain with you after this event concludes. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Provost Stoucy. Uh, and I'm so glad to be with all of you here tonight, um, including the, I know, hundreds who have registered for the live stream of this event. So we're not just here with those of us in the room, but especially in these COVID times, we're here with um, so many more who are attending virtually. And I'm pleased to, to talk to you tonight about these two outstanding scholars. I'm going to introduce both of them now, uh, beginning with Dr. DeAnda and then with Reverend Dr. James Keenan. Responding to our keynote address tonight is Dr. Naomi DeAnda. Dr. DeAnda currently serves as an Associate Professor of Religious Studies and a Research Associate with the Human Rights Center at the University of Dayton. She holds a PhD in Constructive Theology from Loyola University, Chicago, and master's degrees in theology from the Oblate School of Theology and in educational leadership from St. Mary's University, both in San Antonio. Dr. DeAnda researches and teaches in the areas of religion, languages, and cultures, Latinx Christology, race and ethnic studies, and women and gender studies. Her research is creative and compelling, traversing wild and wide terrains of thought from theological reflection on chisme, Spanish for gossip, breast milk and miscarriage, to Catholic higher education and to the intersections of race, gender, migration, labor, and ecology. She grounds this research in partnership with the Marianist Social Justice Collaborative and the Hope Border Institute. In addition to her teaching and publishing, Dr. DeAnda served as the most recent past president for the Academy of Catholic Hispanic Theologians in the United States. She was recently honored with the University of Dayton Award for Faculty Teaching and for the 2020 Courageous Woman's Voice Award. Dr. DeAnda, we warmly welcome you to Duquesne and look forward to your contributions to our conversation tonight. And now, I'm fortunate and joyful to have the opportunity to introduce a beloved teacher and mentor to a beloved community of students and scholars. So this is a long form introduction, so buckle up, folks. <laughs> Reverend Dr. James Keenan was educated at Fordham University Weston Jesuit School of Theology, and the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. In 1982, he was ordained a Jesuit priest. Jim has been a member of the faculty at Fordham, Weston Jesuit, and Boston College, and he served as a visiting professor at the Gregorian John Carroll University, the Ateneo de Manila in the Philippines, and Dharmaram Vidya Keshetram in India. He currently serves as Vice Provost for Global Engagement, Canisius Professor of Theological Ethics, and Director of the Jesuit Institute at Boston College. In 2019, he received the John Courtney Murray Award for Lifetime Achievement 
from the Catholic Theological Society of America. For many of us in this room, we first met James Keenan through his writings. And I happen to know that for a lot of us in this room, um, you met Jim Keenan through his celebrated book, Moral Wisdom. Over the past 15 years, nearly every undergraduate student at Duquesne who has taken the course Theological Ethics, or now Bridges Introduction to Theological Ethics, or Introduction to Ethical uh, Reasoning, have been touched by Jim's book. This amounts to thousands of current students and alumni. Through moral wisdom, Duquesne's student body has learned to distinguish the voice of conscience, calling you to grow in virtue, from the superego telling you to conform to social standards. You've come to understand that the love of God precedes all else and is the primary driving force for human behavior. And you've learned that mercy is the willingness to enter into the chaos of another so as to answer them in their need. Jim's work as a teacher and a scholar of theological ethics demonstrates time and time again his own commitment to these principles, virtue, mercy, and the love of God that pursues us and that we share with one another. Among his current and former students, Jim is known as an extraordinary teacher and mentor. His former student, Michael Jaycox, recently told me, the thing that stays with me about Jim is how committed he was to helping me use my own voice to speak. He emphasized to me that he didn't teach to clone himself. His point is to mentor people who are developing their theological voice. Indeed, about his own pedagogical commitments, Jim has written, I am always interested in developing a student's voice. One's voice is like a fingerprint the singular trademark of being able to articulate what one thinks and believes. As a former student of Jim myself, I can confirm his commitment to helping young scholars find their voice. In his course on 20th century theological ethics, Jim encouraged me to follow my passion across cultures, affirming my interest in African ethics and theologies of enculturation. The paper I wrote for his course eventually became my first professional publication and set me, a white Euro-American female scholar from a working class family in a small town in Illinois, on the path to teaching and researching not only here at DU, but also in Kenya, Uganda, and Ghana. In conversations I've had recently with Jim's former students, colleagues, and collaborators, more than anything, I have heard words describing him as, quote, a gifted mentor, a teacher who is generous with his time, and one who is committed to lifting up and empowering new voices." End quote. Jim is also a prolific writer, having edited or written more than two dozen books and published over 400 essays, articles, and reviews. That's the part where you're supposed to gasp. <gasps> he has presented his research in North America, Europe, Asia, South America, Australia, and Africa. And if you're counting, that is six out of seven continents. I don't know if he has any plans for a lecture in Antarctica in the spring. Most recently, Jim wrote University Ethics, How Colleges Can Build and Benefit from a Culture of Ethics, and edited two books, Building Bridges in Sarajevo, and Street Homelessness and Catholic Theological Ethics. His A History of Catholic Ethics is due out next year. The themes of his scholarship traverse even more territory than Keenan himself. They deal with the contributions of Thomas Aquinas, virtue ethics, casuistry, conscience, embodiment, spirituality, solidarity, and suffering. Biblical approaches to ethics with exegeses of the Ten Commandments, Jesus' parables, the Beatitudes, and the letters of Paul. He has treated dozens of thorny issues in medical ethics and recently in organizational ethics, from the church's response to the sexual abuse crisis, to women's inclusion in Catholic hierarchy, to the ethical organization of universities from the rights of adjuncts right down to the problem of hazing in Greek life. Jim is indeed a talented researcher, writer, and editor. By collaborator Kristen Heyer, Jim has been lauded for, quote, combining profound theological insights with engaging narratives, end quote. And likewise, by Catherine Geddick Soltis, has been called, quote, a master at conveying the dynamic of Catholic moral thought, weaving together theological scholarship with autobiography and the arts, end quote. Finally, 
What makes Jim a particular phenomenon in the academy and the church may be what Heyer describes as his capacity to build bridges and what prompted his colleague, Dan Daly, to call Jim the best networker the Guild has ever seen. I am referring to Jim's efforts to found the network known as Catholic Theological Ethics in the World Church, or we call it C to C. C to C held its first international meeting in 2006, and since then, Jim has led nine additional regional or global conferences in cities around the world, from Bangalore to Bogota, Nairobi to Krakow, Sarajevo to Manila. This prompted friend and colleague Agnes Brazil to joke that Jim seems to know the best restaurants in every major city on the planet, which is true. Through C to C, Jim is personally responsible for connecting hundreds of Catholic ethicists from diverse latitude and longitude, expanding the conversation on Catholic ethics around the globe. Jim's devotion to C to C, like all his work, emerges from his foundational experience of the love of God. About C to C, Jim writes, each of us Catholic ethicists has heard the command to love. And when we look at the world and the church, we often see human suffering and we know that we have to respond to it. Motivated by love, we are connected by faith and hope to respond. We believe that this is our shared vocation as Catholic theological ethicists in the world church. And we support each other in living it out. Provost Dowsey, students, colleagues, honored guests, and the hundreds watching via live stream to deliver the 14th annual Holy Spirit lecture titled Grieving in the Upper Room, Vulnerability, Recognition, Conscience, and the Holy Spirit, I give you James Keenan. I've been working on the topic of <clears throat> vulnerability and recognition for a while now. And when I got invited to do this lecture, um, I wanted to know um, how could I talk about vulnerability better and decided to explore the question of grief. And I've never, there's no one I was mentioning uh, to my colleagues I don't know of anybody in ethics who's written on grief. Uh, people in systematic and theology have written on grief, but um, those of us in ethics don't. Um, so to write on grief and to share it with you is um, a very vulnerable exploration. Um, and uh, it's a vulnerability that I can sense right now quite a bit. I'm particularly grateful for Anna uh, putting together um, the people who will be engaging this project, uh, Naomi, uh, Melissa, Rufus, Amanda, and Chuck. Um, I'm really looking forward to what you have to say because this is my first foray into grief and it's, it's, a, it's such a sensitive issue that it's very hard um, to explore it from beyond your own experience. Um, it's something that your resonance is with your own grief and grief in your own life, which you'll hear in this presentation. The comment um, about my influence on, I want to, uh, I want to say to all the students here, um, to give you an idea of what a notable uh, place Duquesne is, um, I was thinking the past hour of a dear friend of mine. Her name was Sister Anne Nasimiu Wasike from Uganda. She's the first woman to get a PhD in theology from Africa, and she got it here. Um, and <laughs> and um, in 1992, she was made Mother General of her order, uh, which incidentally for the Feast of St. Francis was the Little Sisters of St. Francis. And um, in 1992, when she took over her order, she found that there were a number of her sisters who were either pregnant or had had children. 
and she wanted to know where the fathers were and found that they were priests who had been sent to Rome. And she wanted to know why were her sisters home with these children and the fathers were not with them. She became actually significantly persecuted by some church leaders for this stance. I had invited her to our first meeting that Anna mentioned in uh, 2006 at Trent, at Padua, to, give it, to be one of the main plenary speakers. And she was told that if she went, um, she would be denied re-entry to her country. She would be, become an exile. She was a very, very courageous person. She finished as, a, as general of her order in 1998, and they elected her again in 2010. She contacted me in 2016 to say, I need a sabbatical. Give me one. She didn't say please or anything. It was an order. And with Anne, with Anne you took orders. And in, in 2017, uh, she arrived and st stayed with us for six months at Boston College. When she arrived, she was exhausted. When she left um, in January of 2018, um, she was completely refreshed and ready to start teaching and working with young religious women, and that was her project. And, um, but two weeks later in Uganda, her native Uganda, she developed malaria and died suddenly. You know, one thing about grief, it, it vivifies your memory. And, you know, this is the tradition of Duquesne. The first woman to do a PhD in theology from Africa did it here um, in Asamu. So let me start. On Tuesday, May 19th, 2015, I received word that my best friend, the Hong Kong Jesuit Yu Sing Lucas Chan, had died of a heart attack, having collapsed on a bench in the corridor of the theology department of Marquette University. Trying to get to his office as he was returning from his daily early morning workout at the university gym, Lucas gave up his last at 6.45 a.m. before any of his colleagues arrived. He was 46 years old, the epitome of healthy living, and his death was overwhelming for all of us, his colleagues, friends, and family. His funeral at Marquette would not be for at least a week, but on May 24th, I was scheduled to preside at the Sunday liturgy at St. Peter's Parish in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I have worked for now nearly 20 years. That Sunday would be Pentecost Sunday. Facing Pentecost, the birthday of the church, the celebration of the spirit descending into the midst of the gathering in the upper room and sending them out inspired and with tongues of fire, I asked, how could I bring my grief to that liturgy? Moreover, since the community knew me well, many would learn by that Sunday that Lucas had died. I would have to bring his sudden grievous death into my Pentecost homily, and this brought me to a new understanding of Pentecost. I need to tell you that I had known sudden death before. My brother Bobby died during an early morning seizure of epilepsy when he was 26 years old and I was 27. That day, June 2nd, 1980, changed the lives of all of us. From Bobby's death, I learned the importance of grieving with others, and that grief alone is a dreadful, painful grief. Grief is meant to be shared, whether in shiver or in a wake or in any gathering. In preparation for that Sunday liturgy, I began asking myself, what were the disciples of Jesus doing in the upper room on the eve of what we now call Pentecost? Indeed, they were waiting for the Spirit, as Luke tells us, but I believe that they were waiting in grief. In fact, I believe that, grieving, that their grieving was constitutive of the process of their recognizing Jesus. Their ability to subsequently witness to Jesus the very message of Pentecost was prompted by this grieving. The scriptures bear this out. In the so-called long canonical ending of Mark's gospel, we learn that the 11 were gathered in the upper room that they were mourning and weeping. Mary Magdalene knows they are there and reports to them that Jesus is alive, but they do not believe her. Again, two more come to report to them in the upper room that they met Jesus on a road, but again, they do not believe. Later, 
We do not know how much later Jesus himself comes to the upper room in Mark's gospel. They recognize him now. He rebukes them for not believing the reports and then commissions them to preach and, to, and he ascends. In Luke's gospel, we hear that on Sunday, three days after the death of Jesus, the women, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other woman, discover the empty tomb and encounter the two men in dazzling clothes who tell them that he has been raised. They run to the disciples in the upper room and the grieving disciples do not believe them, though Peter runs to the tomb and is amazed by the tomb being empty. Then the encounter at Emmaus is described where two disciples in their shared grief, for that is at first what prevents them from recognizing him, their grief talk of Jesus' death, but then in the breaking of the bread, recognize him and rush back again to the upper room to tell the 11. As they enter the room, the 11 tell the two from Emmaus that the Lord has risen and appeared to Peter and then, to the, two, and then the two make their report. Unlike Mark, Luke reports that the 11 reportedly believe that Jesus has been raised before Jesus appears, which then occurs as the Emmaus disciples are present. Jesus extends to them his peace, eats fish, and tells them to stay in Jerusalem because he is, quote, sending upon you what my father promised. He walks to Bethany and then ascends. In the Acts of the Apostles, after the ascension of Jesus, the disciples return to Jerusalem and immediately go to the upper room where we are told the 11 are staying, devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. Luke makes a point that they have been there for, four, for several days between the end of the resurrection appearances and the Pentecost, during which they chose a twelfth to replace Judas. Then the day of Pentecost occurs. Again, it seems, as they are in the upper room, and the Spirit now descends on them and fills the entire house. In John's Gospel, Mary Magdalene discovers the empty tomb, rushes to report the missing body of Jesus to Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved. They rush to the tomb and then return to their houses. Mary, however, remains at the tomb and is grieving outside the tomb, distressed that not only Jesus' life has been taken away, but now his body as well. Jesus approaches her in her grief and confusion, and she does not recognize him until he calls her by name. She clings to him. He tells her to stop holding on and then commissions her to tell the disciples. Jesus later that day, John reports, goes to the disciples who are gathered in the upper room and then returns a week later again to the upper room to reveal himself to Thomas. When I had to preach on Pentecost, I experienced in myself such a grief I was fully vulnerable to the working of the Holy Spirit. In fact, I resonated with the disciples weeping and grieving in the upper room where they could not believe the news that was being reported. I resonated with the grief of Mary, who first weeps outside the tomb, thinking that now even the body of Christ is gone. She cannot recognize Jesus by sight, but only later through her grief when she hears his name. And I resonated with the disciples of Emmaus, who had had such hopes that they cannot recognize the fellow pilgrim until he breaks the bread. This, their grief, was not an obstacle to their eventual capacity to recognize Jesus, but rather the passageway to recognition. Through their grieving, they became vulnerable enough to their love for Jesus that they could recognize his risen presence. These words, grief, vulnerability, and recognition, words in the title of this talk, are here inextricably linked to the Pentecost story, and in particular, to the role of the Spirit plays in our lives and in the church. The phenomenon of grief is the willing openness, the willing openness to the loss of love. That's what I call grief, the willing openness to the loss of love. During that Pentecost, I discovered that my grief was a form of love. In fact, whenever I touch that grief, and I do every day, I encounter the love that connected me to my friend Lucas. Entrance into grief is not solely an encounter with absence, but with presence as well. The more one feels the presence of the love, the deeper one feels the loss. And yet the gulf of love remains, like the upper room itself, a place of vulnerability. 
When I think of the disciples, Mary and the others, grieving in the upper room, I think it was there that they gathered to grieve. There, after all, was where they celebrated the Last Supper, a meal that Jesus initiated to be repeated after his forthcoming departure. There they returned after the time in the Mount of Olives, after the time on Golgotha, and after from the burial to the tomb, from the burial in the tomb. When the twelve are gathered in the upper room with Mary, they are grieving with one another. They're going there because they're sharing their grief, but their grief is not the, like some check-in. They are not consoling one another by saying, are you okay? Mary, how are you doing? Peter, are you okay? I think instead of doing a check-in with one another, they just talked about all the love that they experienced for Jesus and that they wanted to hear from one another how Jesus was loved by others, how he was valued, and how they were valued as by him. And so they wanted to hear how Peter loved Jesus, how Mary, the mother of Jesus, loved Jesus, how the Magdalene loved Jesus, how Andrew and John and the others loved Jesus. And it's in the hearing of these narratives that I think that they were consoled. In their shared grief, they gave, to one, they gave one another the experience of their love for and from Jesus. It was in this, that space that first Jesus and then the Spirit found their place to enter into the upper room. In the loving grief of the upper room, the Spirit found her place. The Pentecost is not simply a sign of the Spirit's descent or the birth of the church, as we've always said. It was a moment of people grieving, people consoling one another about the fact that they loved Jesus who loved them and died for them. Out of that expression of grief, they recognized their salvation and found a way to move forward by the Spirit. In a similar way, every Christian funeral is a replay of the upper room. When I preside at a funeral, I enter into not the presence, but the felt absence of the person loved, the raw, emotional, gut-wrenching experience of love exposed because the other has died. Those who believe the promise of the resurrection encounter it not by negating grief or transcending it, but by entering it. The promise is not a quick fix imposed, but rather something believers recognize as they grieve. Through grief, we experience and can recognize the promise of the resurrection. The felt love with the now deceased remains as the bridge through grief. So a word on the gap of grief. Several weeks after my brother Bobby died, I received from a Jesuit a letter with these words from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Nothing can fill the gap left by someone we love, and we should not attempt to find it anything. We must simply endure and hold out. That may sound very harsh at first, but at the same time, it is a great comfort because as the hole that he has left remains unfilled, so the connection with him remains. It is wrong to say God fills the gap. God does not fill it at all. Rather, God leaves the gap unfilled. And in this way, God helps us to maintain our true communion with our beloved one, even though it is painful. Bonhoeffer wrote these words on Christmas Eve, 1943, to his closest friends, Renate and Eberhard Bethge, as he lay in prison in Tegel, later to be executed on April 9, 1945. These words of Bonhoeffer were an enormous consolation to my family. We experienced precisely in the gap of grief, the way to maintain our true communion with our loved one, Bobby. I have come to believe that grief reveals human vulnerability, which is, I will posit, our ability to be connected. Grief which arises from the separation of being connected is the exposition of our underlying vulnerability. In the Christian funeral, we do not therefore deny the pain of death, but rather touch precisely the loss. I think that is how the disciples recognize Christ, not in spite of the grief, but through it. They dared to feel the loss of Jesus, to share the love he had for them and they for him. The grief is integral to their recognition of the resurrected Jesus.
The grief made them more aware of their own vulnerability to Jesus, to the love of God, and to the working of the Spirit. Let me add, they grieved his death even after the resurrection appearances. Mary of Magdala grieved that she had to let go of the risen Jesus and could not hold him again. The disciples of Emmaus grieved that he disappeared after the breaking of the bread. And Peter and John assuredly looked for Jesus time and again on the beach. It was that grief that gave them the conviction to preach Jesus raised. But they, like Paul, longed for death so as to be reunited with the one they lost on earth. Peter grieved until he was crucified and Paul too until he was executed. Let us not think that the appearances eradicated the grief, but rather gave grief a new energy, a new reason to hope through grief across the gap. Let us turn for a moment to the scriptures and see this more clearly. We all know that the shortest verse in the Bible is, Jesus wept in John chapter 11, verse 35. Note, Jesus does not begin to weep when encountered by Martha or Mary but rather when he literally confronts the reality of Lazarus as dead, that is, when he is brought to the tomb. Grief exposed Jesus' vulnerability to Lazarus. And that is revealed to us in the very next verse. Quote, then the Jews said, see how he loved him. Through grief, the spirit leads us as vulnerable in the face of death through love to hope. Let us now look at a very particular text on grieving. Blessed are they who mourn, the second macarism of the eight Mithean Beatitudes. Lucas Chan, in his book, The Ten Commandments and the Beatitudes, Biblical Studies and the Ethics for Real Life, opens up the Beatitudes by following the insight of John Climacus that the Beatitudes are a ladder of ascent. In this way, we can see that we can only understand each beatitude through the previous one. We can only ascend the ladder one step at a time. Chan notes, therefore, the overarching importance of the very first beatitude, where we start by turning our gaze on the poor in spirit, who are the most poor of the poor, economically deprived and socially alienated. Turning to the second macarism, blessed are they who mourn, Chan notes that this is not a command to mourn, but rather the recognition of those who already are mourning. More importantly, the object of one's mourning is not one's own loss, but the condition of those who are poor in spirit. It is an empathetic mourning. Reading the Beatitudes along with the exegetical claims of Hans Dieter Betz, William Davies, and Dale Allison, as well as the theologian Gerald Van. Chan argues, quote, the object of mourning is not so much one's own sufferings, but rather the concrete human experience of poverty and suffering encountered by community members, that is, the poor in spirit. Mourning points to the, an other-oriented moral value. Chan adds, it is about a certain disposition that certain genuine disciples have with one another, such that if one suffers, the other mourns as well. Mourning, he writes, is then the ready subordination of one's own comfort and well-being to the suffering of others, and is the necessary step prior to consoling others. Mourning always encounters a response of God. Just as Jeremiah consoles the mourners of Zion, so God turns mourning into joy, like a mother who comforts her child. Still, in this second macarism, those who mourn are therefore like the Lord who is close to the brokenhearted, wanting to respond to, quote, those who are crushed in spirit, as the psalmist says. In his book on the Beatitudes, Chan takes us up the ladder to the third Beatitude, where we learn meekness so that we can give up our tendency to condescend when we seek to respond to the poor in spirit to the fourth, where we practice hunger and thirst, not as protest over the human condition, but rather as ascetical practices so that we can really become the meek people that we need to become to learn better how to respond to the poor in spirit. 
to the fifth, where we now are able to be merciful because we have cultivated true mourning or human empathy with meekness and asceticism, so as to be merciful to the poor in spirit or with the poor in spirit. To the sixth, where by being merciful, we are no longer self-centered, but rather finally pure in heart. We're following Kierkegaard. We are capable of willing one thing, and that is the salvation of the poor in spirit. To the seventh, whereby being now reconciled to all that is alienated within ourselves, we can make peace with others as well. And finally, at the eighth stage, inevitably, we will encounter the fateful rejection, so clearly the outcome of those who labor with and work with the poor in spirit. Grieving for the other's loss, their alienation, suffering, or death is the beginning of the beatitudinal response of the call to genuine discipleship, that is, of responding to the poor in spirit. It is what the spirit recognized in the upper room, and it is what precedes all else in the ladder of ascent. For the Christian, it is not the denial of suffering and death, but the encounter with loss and suffering of another, encountering the, in, entering into their loss. We are led by the spirit as disciples were led to not only recognize the risen Jesus, but to unabashedly preach him. I have been writing and speaking on the topics of vulnerability and recognition for the past four or five years, and I do this because I believe that prior to acting in conscience, we need to be vulnerable, which gives us the capability to recognize. In order to act on that recognition, we need subsequently to turn our consciences to deliberate about what we should do. My interest these past four years has been to explore what precedes conscience. I'm, I'm very interested in the fact that in teaching, I've been teaching now for 30 years, I can teach anything about conscience formation. I can tell you what a virtue is, what a value is, what a principle is, yada, 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 yada. Whether you do anything was already decided before you came into the classroom. It's whether you're vulnerable and whether you're capable of recognizing. And it's only now these past four or five years, that's what I'm focusing in on. Why aren't we teaching about vulnerability and recognition? And that's what I'm trying to do. And that's why I'm trying to evoke grief as a pathway to understand not only vulnerability, but how grief allows us to recognize. I argue that what conscience needs is a vulnerable disposition that recognizes what is needed. Now, however, here at Duquesne, I am arguing about ways that we can get a glimpse of how our vulnerability becomes alive. And I am arguing that a look at grief helps us to see how we humans become vulnerable and that precisely by staying in touch with that vulnerability, we are led by the spirit to encounter hope in the face of death. In a moment, I will move to the topic of vulnerability and recognition more analytically, but let me now note that believers ought not to be surprised that an evidently vulnerable experience like grief can be a mine for healthy human living. Between the deaths of Bobby and Lucas, I also experienced an advanced cancer and learned a bit about the notion of the sick self from the pragmatist William James. In a talk I gave at the CTSA, the Catholic Theological Society of America called Impasse, that Brian Massengale invited me to give, I spoke about the fact that I was living then with an advanced melanoma that gave me a 50% chance of survival over the next five years. Among other matters, I remarked how I found myself experiencing something akin to William James' twice-born person. After extensive surgery, I went through a fairly brutal regime of 12 months on interferon. Despite the sustained and compelling depression and fatigue, as well as the nightly sweats and the low-grade and sometimes spiked fevers which I got from interferon, I was experiencing a new and reconciled peace in my life that I never knew before I became ill. In my recovery, I was discovering a newfound ability to appreciate the present. I always aimed for the future. To attend to those whose lives were far more in jeopardy than my own, and to appreciate more deeply the humanity of the people I met, to sense the abiding presence of the Lord, to be far less trapped by my own fears, and to stand in hope, not despite, but because of the ambiguity within which I lived. Though these sentiments were still in their early stages as I reported them at this meeting, 
all of this was very reconciling, and I found that the more I identified with others' suffering, the more able I was able to bear my own. Though with others, I, I think, remembering our disciples in the upper room, this is a lesson that we need to constantly reiterate. James distinguished between, William James distinguished between the healthy soul and the sick soul. The healthy soul is a person who is able to pursue her or his own desires. The sick soul has conflict, struggle, and frustration throughout life and knows a great deal about evil and sin. Because of this striving, only the sick soul becomes a twice-born person, argues James. This rebirth resonated with my own experience. James writes, the process is one of redemption, not of mere reversion to natural health and the sufferer when, when saved, is saved by what seems to him a second birth, a deeper kind of conscience being than he could enjoy before. I know that many, many here have had similar experiences of the sick soul, whether from disease, alcoholism, drug addiction, betrayal, censure, job loss, death, divorce, abandonment, the death of a spouse, a child, or a loved one. I'm deliberately trying to tap into another vulnerable experience like grief. That is your own experiences of the sick soul as well, because I think the key to life is an ability to live cognitively, emotionally, and spiritually with one's vulnerability while being in union with others in theirs. In other words, the key to life is to be vulnerable. Indeed, I do not think that Peter, the Magdalene, Mary, the mother of Jesus, Thomas, or John ever really left their grief behind. In fact, Paul himself so resonated with the death of Jesus that he therein found his freedom and the promise of life. I think for them, as for Bonhoeffer, the gap that death causes is never really closed. I think this is why Paul in Romans 8 assures us that we are led by the Spirit precisely in our sufferings. We groan through our sufferings into becoming the children of God, and this groaning occurs through, as Paul notes, the present time. He adds, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Whether in grief, in suffering, or in the sick self, we experience the Spirit leading us, accompanying us, expressing for us, and from us, what we learn, yearn and hope for. In the rawest moments of human vulnerability, the Spirit gives us hope by her own actions. Where we are vulnerable, the Spirit finds our home. Let us now look at eth the, an ethical connection between vulnerability and recognition, which I argue initiates all moral action. For the past several years, I've been exploring this question, what gets a person to act in conscience? That is, I began to asking what prompts moral responsiveness. Interestingly, Thomas Aquinas also recognized that there was something that inclined conscience to act, but he never developed it. For Thomas, conscience was not the source of moral responsiveness. Rather, for him, prior to conscience was what he called a human inclination to the good. He named it cinderesis. What many of us know is that in the Summa Theologiae, Thomas wrote that conscience was not a power or a faculty or a disposition, but simply an act. When we act in conscience, we descend into the particulars about what our moral response should be. In the Summa, in the article prior to the one on conscience, Thomas asked about a closely related aspect of the moral life called cinderesis. There he argued that cinderesis is a habit that inclines us to the good and murmurs at evil. This initial habit is for Thomas what eventually launches the act of conscience. Like Thomas, I want to argue that something precedes conscience, something that inclines us toward the good, the neighbor. In what follows, I want to first examine vulnerable dispositions and then recognition, and I will close by returning to the spirit, in particular to the work of Thomas in the spirit prompting in our vulnerability the need for recognition. I began these investigations because I saw that in the Bible, for the most part, moral failure was not about getting things wrong. Rather, moral failure was prior to that. Moral failure was really the failure 
to bother to respond in the first place. Think, the priest and the Levite pass by the man on the road in the Good Samaritan parable. The goats don't see the hungry and the naked in Matthew 25. The rich man steps over Lazarus. None of them respond. It's not that they get something wrong in conscience. On the contrary, they haven't even started to use their consciences. It is for this reason in my writings I insist that sin is the failure to bother to love. Is there then something that starts this ball rolling? Is there something that precedes the act of conscience that considers, well, what am I to do? Is there something we are not forming that eventually gets one in to act in the first place? I think the problem is that we teach people what moral action is, but we don't adequately consider whether they are vulnerably disposed to the other in the first place. In a similar way, besides being vulnerably disposed, do we know that they will actually recognize the others as well? I think there are two steps before acting in conscience, being vulnerably disposed and then actually recognizing. I think we teach people that they in conscience should do what they in conscience should do, but we rarely address the preconditions to the conscience act. Let's look for a moment at the Good Samaritan parable. I do not know if the priest and the Levite could have acted in conscience, but I do know two things. Neither were vulnerably disposed to the injured man, and neither gave him the recognition that he was injured and in need. On the other hand, the Good Samaritan's first recognition of the injured man gives evidence of his vulnerability to the wounded man. Then, after he recognized the man as being in need, he, in conscience, went about the details of what he needed to do. Acting in conscience, he needed to figure out how to clean the wounds, how to get him to a safe place, how to make inquiries about the appropriate place in which to leave him, how to negotiate and secure from the innkeeper his oversight of the injured man, how to dispense with his funds, how to redesign his return to this particular inn so as to take the man with him, etc., etc. The Good Samaritan's conscience got a workout. But the work of his conscience only began when his vulnerable disposition recognized the man. The recognition led then to the conscience question, now what am I to do? Like many others, when I first thought of vulnerability, I considered it singularly as being wounded, as primarily a condition that raises in others alarm and concern. From the writings of the philosopher Judith Butler, among others, however, I began to see vulnerability as less being wounded and more about being capacious and more responsive, much more like those who emerge from the upper room capable of preaching. When I recognize that the word vulnerable does not mean having been wounded, but rather being able to be wounded, then I began to see how it means being exposed to the other, in this sense, vulnerability is the human condition that allows me to hear, encounter, receive, or respond to the other, even to the point of being injured. Or as we saw earlier in grief, when we, lost, when we lose someone in death, we see the nakedness of love in the vulnerability of grief. There we see that our humanity is identified with our vulnerability. Being vulnerable should not be reduced, therefore, to being precarious. Precarity is being in an unstable or risky situation when the possibility or the continuation of harm occurs. Butler realizes that too many people think of vulnerability as primarily being in an unstable context. She rather wants us to understand that all of us as human beings are vulnerable to one another. And precisely when one's vulnerability is at risk, we vulnerably respond to that other. So wisely, she distinguishes precarity as a moment of risk for the vulnerable human. She notes, precarity exposes our sociality, the fragile and necessary dimensions of our interdependency. But our vulnerability is not reduced to precarity, a moment of instability. For this reason, I do not identify grief and illness with vulnerability, but rather they bring us into contact with the vulnerability that defines our humanity. Following Butler, I think of human vulnerability as the capacity for responsiveness. In shared grief, we mutually recognize our human vulnerability. 
We mutually recognize our capacities to love one another. Vulnerably, we continue to love in grief. I want us to be careful about thinking, however, that we need to suffer in order to be vulnerable. As vulnerable, we need to be responsive. We need to be able to accompany, like the mourners, the meek and the merciful and the Beatitudes, those responding and accompanying vulnerably the poor in spirit as we ascend the ladder of ascent. The experience of grief and of the sick self shows us not in need, but as vulnerable. We would not grieve if we were not so vulnerable to one another. Watch, however, how vulnerability works in the Good Samaritan parable. Remember, the question that prompts the parable is, who is my neighbor? At the beginning of the parable, we think that the man wounded on the road is the neighbor. Surely he's the vulnerable one, we think. But after the priest and the Levite pass by, we see the Samaritan recognize the wounded one. And then we recognize in the Samaritan his vulnerability. At the end, we want to be like the vulnerable neighbor, the one who showed mercy. Like the notion of neighbor, vulnerability moves from the wounded one to the responsive one. The Samaritan becomes the neighbor in his vulnerability. Watch how similarly vulnerability works in the prodigal son parable. At the beginning, the son's own precarious vulnerability is evident. He's eating with the pigs. But while the beginning of that parable focuses on the younger brother's situation, the center of the parable emerges as we recognize the vulnerability of the father who recognizes his son in the distance, embraces him, reincorporates him, and works to restore all that was unstable, threatened, exposed, and jeopardized. Like the vulnerable good Samaritan, the vulnerable father recognizes his son as the precarious one whose humanity was not recognized by those who left him to eat with the pigs. Butler recognizes how fundamentally foundational vulnerability is. She writes, ethical obligation not only depends upon our vulnerability to the claims of others, but establishes us as creatures who are fundamentally defined by that ethical relation. Vulnerability is what defines and establishes us as capable of being moral among one another. Again, emphasizing the priority of vulnerability, she writes, this is a sentence, uh, two, uh, three sentences that has really fixed me. This ethical relation is not a virtue that I have or exercise. It is prior to any sense of the self. It is not as discrete individuals that we honor this ethical relation. I am already bound to you. And this is what it means to be the self I am, receptive to you in ways that I cannot fully predict or control. Vulnerability essentially is what most qualifies myself as being bound to and among others. Butler returns to the priority of vulnerability as prior even to the moan from another in need. She writes, you call upon me and I answer, but if I answer, it was only because I was already answerable. That is, this susceptibility and vulnerability constitutes me at the most fundamental level and is there, we might say, prior to any deliberate decision to answer the call. In other words, one has to be already capable of receiving the call before actually answering it. In this sense, ethical responsibility presupposes ethical responsiveness. Our vulnerability is our answerability, what allows and prompts us to recognize, to respond, to communicate, in short, to love. Theologically, Butler's natural created answerableness resonates with a variety of creation narratives that capture the vulnerability of the human, as you began this evening with. Though not from a theologian, T.H. White's wonderful The Once and Future King provides an account of creation that captures it beautifully. On the sixth day of creation, God gathers all the embryos, just imagine that, God gathers all the embryos of all of creation, of each and every species of animal life. As such, they are rolling around. The embryos don't do anything but roll around. As they're rolling around all over the place. One can imagine what the hall looked like. And, and all look like one another. But God offers, in this story, each embryo the opportunity to ask for an addition that will distinguish their species. 
The giraffe embryo gets a long neck for tree food. The porcupine asks for quills for protection. And so it goes for the entire animal kingdom. The last embryo is the human, Adam, who when asked by God what Adam wants, responds, I think that you made me in the shape which I am now for reasons best known to yourselves, and that it would be rude to change. I will stay a defenseless embryo all my life. God is delighted and lets the human embryo have no particular protection to be the most vulnerable of all newborns and says, as for you, Adam, you will look like an embryo till they bury you. Behind White's imaginative portrayal of creation is his remarkable vision of the human embryo as the bearer of human vulnerability. By positing the human as willing to remain vulnerable, White is able to disclose further God's delight in that the human now is in God's image, precisely because of the decision to stay as defenseless all my life. White concludes his account with God, revealing to the human, with God revealing to the human, Adam, eternally undeveloped, you will always remain potential in our image, able to see some of our sorrows and to feel some of our joys. We are partly sorry for you, human, but partly hopeful. Human dignity, rooted in the image of God, participates in the vulnerability of God. This insight of our vulnerability being connected to God's resonates with the great Irish theologian Enda McDonough's work, Vulnerable to the Holy in Faith, Morality, and Art. There he begins his treatment on vulnerability with God. God reveals to us God's self as vulnerable by the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, his life in Nazareth, his death in Golgotha. Thus sounding like white, McDonough writes that to be made in God's image is to be made vulnerable. Our dignity is rooted in God's vulnerability. I have a doctoral student right now who's just submitting his proposal, and it's um, what would happen if we changed the creedal formula to not I believe in God the Father Almighty, but I believe in a vulnerable God. What would happen? So finally, recognition. There is much more to say on vulnerability, but now I turn to the psychoanalyst and feminist theorist, Jessica Benjamin, who studied mutual recognition among infants. Mutual recognition is the central experience among infants. After being the object of attention much, of people much bigger than themselves, mutual recognition is where an infant finally encounters another infant, or a few, that seem much like themselves and yet not. They want to touch the face of the other child. They are fascinated that this child in front of them is just like them. They mutually recognize each other. In that moment, they recognize their humanity. Benjamin writes, mutual recognition is the most vulnerable process in, vulnerable point in the process of differentiation. She adds, in mutual recognition, the subject accepts the premise that others are separate, but nonetheless share the feelings and intentions. More recently, she turns again to mutual recognition and, among other matters, finds the language of vulnerability key for recuperating and restoring the experience of mutual recognition. As in shared grief, in mutual recognition, we discover human vulnerability, our connectedness, and our responsiveness. As we mature, the experience of mutual recognition can and should happen time and again as part of our growth as moral agents. The mutual recognition in infancy becomes the foundation for subsequent expressions of due recognition whenever we encounter humanity in its greatest precarity or neglect. From that first recognition where we vulnerably acknowledge the others and our own humanity, we learn to develop a sense that the other in need is another human being. Of course, as we saw earlier in the biblical stories, overlooking the humanity of the other is what gives us the unfortunate permission to withhold recognition, do recognition. Thus, the work of education is to help one another to be vulnerable and vigilant enough so that due recognition and appropriate response to the other is actualized as the worthy alternative to the customary but harmful stance of overlooking or neglect. The philosopher Patty McQueen explained Recognition as an insight and a practice that develops, going from first being an awakening to second being a form of identification, and finally to appreciating a responsible relationship that broadens our self-understanding. He writes, 
The term recognition has several distinct right meanings. First, an act of intellectual apprehension, as such as when we recognize that we have made a mistake or we recognize the influence of a religion on American politics. It's an act of apprehension. The second, though, is a form of identification, such as when we recognize a friend on the street. And the third is the act of acknowledging or respecting another being, such as when we recognize someone's status, achievements, or rights. The philosophical and political notion of recognition predominantly refers to this third point and is often taken to mean that not only is recognition an important means of valuing or respecting another person, it is also fundamental to understanding ourselves. McQueen's move from recognizing someone familiar to giving recognition to one to whom it is due, I think is the threshold of the moral life. When we learn in infancy, what we learn in infancy is literally a first lesson. In our vulnerability, we recognize that we are related one to the other. Then we move from that awakening to a form of identification. Later as children, we realize that form of identification calls us to a form of responsiveness, especially when the other is neglected in need or oppressed. The awakening to and the identification with another's humanity are therefore the first steps toward and across the moral threshold. We re can return in closing to the prodigal son parable to uncover recognition's rich relationship with both the vulnerable and the familiar. In the parable, as the vulnerable father attends to the prodigal, he remains vulnerable to the older son as well, who does not suffer from precarity, but from dominance which expresses itself in his resentfulness. Still, we should not think that the father is surprised by the older son's resentment. When he sees his younger son in the distance, the father of the two sons knows that in his movement toward the prodigal, he will surely trigger the older son's insecurities that are covered by his dominance. Here then we recognize the father's own vulnerability that anchors both sons. The stability of the story is the vulnerable father as the precarious son returns and the resentful one tries to leave. The enduring, vigilant, attentive, and responsive father is so because he is vulnerable. So when the older son refers to his brother as that son of yours, the father wants him to recognize his brother and says, this brother of yours was dead and has come to life but the brother needs to be vulnerable before he can recognize. Without it, due recognition just does not happen. Like the father in the prodigal son parable, the spirit prompts us to recognize. In his new book, The Holy Spirit and Moral Action in Thomas Aquinas, Jack Marnie notes that the idea of the spirit prompting was a phrase used often and dear to Thomas, prompting is not simply being led or guided. It is an internal awakening, a counsel to take heed, to act, to respond. That is, I dare suggest, to recognize. Remembering that recognition is the first act that causes us to cross the threshold of moral responsiveness, we read that Thomas asserts that, quote, in every action of the spiritual person, it is the initiative of the Holy Spirit, which is the source and principle of the action and that God's children are truly acted upon, though in such a way that they act themselves. Noting the principle which Thomas regularly observes that no habit proceeds to act spontaneously, it needs to be aroused by some agent, I think we can see that the pivotal act of recognition is prompted in us by the counsel of the Spirit opening our eyes to the other. The Spirit helps us to recognize again and again in his commentary on Romans, Thomas writes, the Holy Spirit does not just teach us what, we ought to, what ought to be done by enlightening our mind on what we should do. The Holy Spirit inclines our desires to act rightly. That original inclination, that cinderesis, being prompted, is the act of recognition. We, all, we need also to remember that all basic moral recognition is mutual recognition. Our failure to recognize the homeless on the road or the alienated in the hospital is a failure to recognize the poor in spirit and failing to recognize the poor in spirit, we fail to recognize or to engage in a true mutual recognition of our shared humanity.
Whether it's the poor in spirit or the risen Lord, the act of recognition is an awareness of a common humanity often overlooked. Let me close, however, prompting you to consider much further the questions that I am interested in pursuing. I do not see recognition as primarily personal or private, but rather social. That's the great problem of our world today. We're not socially recognizing. In the limits of time, I do not explore that. I've just been trying to provoke. But here I leave in my bibliography what I have written elsewhere on human recognition. Here in this talk, I offered you grief in the upper room as a way of capturing a capacious vulnerability. But let me leave you with another image, another location, so as to appreciate the richness and power of recognition, the first act of vulnerable people. The image are the protests that began in Minneapolis on May 26, 2020, the day after George Floyd, an African-American man, was killed during a police arrest. On June 6, an estimated half a million people joined protests in 550 places across the country. The people in the march were recognizing that black lives matter, that George Floyd mattered, and horrendously, that Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and thousands of others who have been killed or murdered matter, though often we have overlooked them, some of us. They were asking, they, they were risking their lives by marching at the peak of COVID-19 in order to awaken in us a recognition. The people in those marches were a people who were grieving, sharing their grief in the shameful public killing of Floyd grieving the profound racist inequity that marks our country. In their grief, they revealed their vulnerability and demanded that we recognize the legitimacy of their lament and the lack of our recognition. They called us and continued to call us as a, to a new mutual recognition to see what we cannot overlook the injustices that white supremacy has visited on this country since 1619. Of course, I'm talking as a white man. In these past 18 months, there has been much grief and much vulnerability, and it's about time that we heed the spirit and begin the process of recognition. We should begin by heeding the call to recognize that black lives matter, and that we ought mutually engage others into recognizing this truth. The time is now to recognize. Indeed, if we cannot see the spirit calling us to recognition in the marches of Minneapolis, after the killing of George Floyd, that Black Lives Matter, then we are never going to understand the spirit who led the disciples out of the upper room. And that is something we should discuss the next time we meet. Thank you. So I clearly had lots to work with, and I'm going to make myself vulnerable, but we've all been sitting for a little bit. So I'm going to give you just like 10 seconds to stand up and stretch and move around a little. Because if you're like me, I'm super fidgety, and it's very difficult for me to sit for this long. Thanks for not leaving in the process. But if you got to go, I get it. All right, so as you settle yourselves back down, I want to begin with some thank yous. Thank you all for being here, those of you who are with us with the live stream as well. It's a beautiful day here in Pittsburgh, and I'm not sure I'd be sitting in this room if I had the choice, but we'll talk about that later too. So thank you for being here and affording us your time, your presence, and your thoughts, which we really want to hear. Uh, thank you also to all of my colleagues who have traveled from near and far to be here, and a special thank you to Patty Mannion for all the care and behind-the-scenes arrangements. I'm a Latina theologian. The question has been raised for years why we need to continue to use adjectives for some theologians and the types of theologies which some engage. 
I've had multiple students recently strongly challenge this practice and say that by engaging in it, we are only reinscribing the same reifying and oppressive othering. I'm so grateful for scholars who are helping us think past adjectival existences like Stefano Montano, who was exploring, quote, as identities are explored, it is important to highlight the diversity of sameness that is embodied in everyone, especially within a socioculturally bodily hermeneutic. Everyone comes from diverse cultural heritages whose histories of migration and intermixing can be traced with a little effort. Anti-racist development theory points to how the realization of this diversity of sameness is important for breaking down supremacist narratives. By complicating everyone's identity, it becomes possible to point to the lie of racial, ethnic, and cultural purity inherent within these narratives. From a sociocultural perspective, the hybridity that each of us embodies is placed on a sliding scale in terms of how we either collaborate in, benefit from the oppression of others, or are victims to that oppression. Intersectionality as a concept highlights the ways that particular combinations of identities are advantaged or disadvantaged in various ways. What the realities of intersectionality also point to is the ability to identify how any of us can embody coalitions of one, pointing to the many avenues for solidarity with others that might share in the oppression of one of our particular identities and building empathy for those who also suffer, but with whom we might not share any similarities." End quote. I took some liberties there. Dr. Montano passed away last week. Rest in power at the age of 37. Dr. Montano, for you are gone from us too soon. We will have to continue to realize different possibilities for theological identification but that's not the focus of my talk today. However, I will say that being an adjectival theologian, as Sister Dr. Jamie Phelps names, means that my God talk, my theologizing, is also adjectival. The title of my talk also gives a Tejana tip to Professor Keenan's contemplative and carefully crafted words today around vulnerability and grief. I didn't bring my tejana as it's a little hot to wear along with a mask, so just pretend I tipped my cowgirl hat. Because, I, I really would wear it if it weren't for the mask. Uh, because of the adjectival thinking in conjunto with Professor Keenan's paper, I have titled my talk, Spirit of Community, Forced Vulnerability, The Little Details as Realized Hope and lament as prophetic protest. Professor Keenan argued here, quote, about ways we get a glimpse of how our vulnerability becomes alive and that a look at grief helps us to see how we humans are vulnerable and that precisely by staying in touch with that vulnerability, we are led by the spirit to encounter hope in the face of death, end quote. In continuing along the platform chosen by Professor Keenan, I pursued thoughts about vulnerability. I thank you for sharing your paper well ahead of time, Professor Keenan, and truly making me think deeply with your words. I'd like to focus on different types of vulnerability. For simplicity here, I've bulked them into two categories, namely chosen and unchosen vulnerability. I therefore argue that when life is forced into vulnerability, death is untimely and grief is compounded. Forced vulnerability hence implores life to clamor for mutual recognition. It is here where we see the spirit of community, which comes from a triune God. A bit of a side note, I usually hate binaries, but here we are. I do invite others to parse out various types of vulnerability. Please continue the conversation. When we think about God from a Christian perspective, many times we think about a chosen vulnerability, especially around theologies of incarnation, 
the chosen vulnerability of God to self-empty and enter into the human experience through kenosis has been raised as problematic throughout several feminist explorations. The problem of an omniscient being who self-empties presented to peoples, particularly women and people of color, who already may hold little or no sense of self, can be used to create more oppressive situations. Sor Maria Ana Águeda de San Ignacio, a 17th century convent nun, mystic, and theologian from Puebla, Mexico, who was also a devotee of Maria de la Leche, speaks about God being able to do as God wished to bring humanity into union with God's self. But God chose to become incarnate, to live, to struggle, to laugh with us. God asked Mary to help with that plan and Mary accepted. God invites us to be co-creators. To be disciples means to co-create like God, like Mary. For the mystic Sor Maria Ana, the self-emptying of God was the choice made by the Godhead to enter vulnerably into human experience and be filled with Mary's breast milk. Therefore, if one reads the self-emptying on the part of the incarnate word as a way for the incarnate word to be filled with Mary's breast milk, then the process of kenosis is twofold. First, the notion of self-emptying stands, but this first part cannot be separated from the second part of filling with knowledge, which begins and ends through the breast milk and its connection to blood. That is clearly a space of vulnerability. So the self-emptying incarnate word must become filled with this breast milk to be nurtured and sustained in human life. This life then leads to the moment on the cross so the blood shed by Jesus on the cross remains fully connected to the breast milk, blood and tears shed by Mary. The connection is so intimate that bodily fluids are shared. Within God's choice to become vulnerable, Jesus as the incarnate word fully enters human experience of both chosen and forced vulnerability. Mary's yes to the request of the angel Gabriel, just a quick side note, my cab driver today is named Gabriel. He was very proud of his name, Gabriel. And I said, I am naming Gabriel in my talk today. So Mary's yes to the request of the angel Gabriel is another moment of chosen vulnerability. However, that yes also means that Mary, a young woman, already in an occupied land, puts herself in further places of forced vulnerability. Returning to the popular tradition of nursing and lactating Madonnas, the flight to Egypt holds a special place for these traditions. The flight to Egypt is one of the seven sorrows of Mary in popular religious traditions surrounding Our Lady of Sorrows. It is also the source of the devotion to Maria Lactans, the nursing Madonna. It's a Marian image that brings together the joy of new life with the struggles of so many to grow, nurture, and help that life to flourish. Jesus lived this tension, and Mary and Joseph were the ones who fought for him to survive. Hold on, I forgot my water. The milk grotto just outside of Bethlehem remains a pilgrimage site, especially for those praying for miracles of and for infants. It's believed that the milk grotto is a spot where the Holy Family stopped so Mary could nurse Jesus during the flight to Egypt. The Holy Family was then living in forced vulnerabilities as refugees seeking sanctuary. I give examples for chosen vulnerability as how in our own theology has led to forced vulnerabilities by God become incarnate, Mary and Joseph. These forced vulnerabilities can be understood through the status of the Holy Family in the world. They were not royalty, but were pursued. It was because of social sin, which came because of occupied lands, that the Holy Family in the flight to Egypt must flee in total vulnerability. His parents were making decisions 
based on survival. The story is many times called the killing of the innocents because many males two years and younger were killed. At least we hear about the males. There may have been females killed as well. We never know. Broken systems lead to systems of brokenness of life. When life is forced into vulnerability, it leads to un untimely death. Social systems which dominate and feed off of life for the sake of a few humans are the social systems which have been named as sinful. These systems of social sin thrive because they mark some for death. The death of Jesus is an untimely death. The disproportionate numbers of people of color who have died from the COVID-19 pandemic are untimely deaths. It's because of social sin of broken systems such as legal capital punishment that Jesus meets his untimely death and is killed on the cross. It is because of capital punishment that Mary weeps and holds her breast because her nursing Jesus is tied to the blood he shed on the cross. It is because of the social sin of capital punishment that Mary and the disciples are grieving in the upper room. What decisions might Mary and the disciples have been making in just trying to survive in that upper room? I think about the grief that Mary was living in the upper room because my middle name is Dolores, I spent some time learning about and praying with Nuestra Señora de Dolores, Our Lady of Sorrows, and the Seven Sorrows of Mary. By the time Mary gets to the upper room, she has lived these seven sorrows, the prophecy of Simeon, the flight to Egypt, the loss of Jesus for three days, the carrying of the cross, the crucifixion of Jesus, Jesus being taken down from the cross and Jesus being laid in the tomb. She is living through compounded grief, also known as cumulative grief. Compounded grief, also known as cumulative grief, is a pile on effect of grief or grief overload. Social sin makes compounded grief prevalent in communities of large marginalization and oppression. The violence inherent within these systems causes pluralities and layers of forced vulnerability. These human created systems dehumanize. All humans should then ask, when will the system turn on me? Some of you may know the popular religious practice around the last four sorrows of Mary known as El Pesame de la Virgen Dolorosa. In this practice, Christians accompany Mary all night on Good Friday until what is considered the resurrection at noon on Saturday, so she is not alone. The word pesame comes from the notion of tu dolor me pesa, or your grief weighs on me, or I feel the weight of your grief. It is not just the sharing of feeling the weight of grief but also accompanying the persons who are grieving and carrying that grief. Professor Gilberto Cavazos Gonzalez speaks as a spiritual logian and helps us think about carrying the weight of each other's grief. He states, quote, as a spirit-led person, the Christian is a compañero or compañera, friend, disciple, lover and spouse, son or daughter, brother or sister of the God, the father, mother, Son and Holy Spirit. In this way, she enters into the familia of God. But a relationship with God needs to be a non exclusive one. The Christian is a part of a traditional familia. In other words, it's an extended family made up of a communion of saints that includes Maria, the saints, and the church. End quote. Compounded grief may lead us to think that people keep complaining about the same thing without trying to move forward. We may keep hearing the same sorrows, yet might those words be more than complaints? May they be lamentations and prophetic words of love? A friend of mine's son 
recently asked my friend what the song Lamento Boliviano by Enanitos Verdes means. I didn't know what kind of technology we were going to have here, otherwise I'd turn this into a concert, but sorry, you gotta keep listening to me instead of, but look this up if you don't speak Spanish. It's lament Bolivian at O's at the end of the word. That sounds terrible, like that's what you need to do for all Spanish, but it really works in this case. And listen to this song. <laughs> I did not expect that to be funny. The <laughs> The singer of this song, which was a party favorite when I was in college, has a passionate yet anguished tone in his delivery. Is it a nonsense song? Is it a song of mere complaint, as a lamento boliviano is known to be? And I think there's probably some racial and class undertones of which I am not aware there, but uh, why it's called a Bolivian lament, I'm not so sure. Is it a protest song? The words of the song translated into English are, they are trying to agitate me. They are inciting my screams. I am like a rock. Words do not touch me. Inside is a volcano which will soon erupt. I want to be calm. It is my situation, so desolate. desolate. I am like a lament, a Bolivian lament, which began one day and will not end. It hurts no one. And now I am here, drunk and crazy, and my dumb heart will always shine. And I will love you, will love you forever. Girlfriend, do not comb your hair in bed, as those always on the move will fall behind. You can see why it can be taken as like, is this a nonsense song? In thinking about people who live with compounded grief, who are often on the move because they are marked for death and trying to manage the many challenges of life, who attend to the little details of life, I am reminded of the Holy Family stopping at the spot that is now the milk grotto to quickly and quietly nurse Jesus, to keep him satisfied and quiet so as not to disclose his and their presence. I interpret the song as protesting those necropolitical powers which destined some for death. The singer is speaking to the woman, yet is also clamoring for all those who live in these precarious situations. Asylum seekers, environmental refugees, those of us unknowingly drinking contaminated water and feeding contaminated breast milk. Essential workers who must be exposed to numerous people in in their commute to and from jobs, as well as at their work. These situations are compounded forced vulnerabilities, the evil of social sin, which puts so many lives in the situation who do not have the luxury of time because they are forever on the move. The Lamento Boliviano then is not just perpetual complaining. It is a prophetic protest. It announces that these lives still exist and refuse to give up. This prophetic protest is caretaking of the fragility of life. This use of breath to clamor is the Holy Spirit. I'm getting a little lighter, so you're not super sad yet. In June, Martin and I threw an ice cream party of the th with the theme of, we made it to today, so let's have ice cream. We invited over 200 people for an outdoor socially distant event across our neighborhood. About 60 people came throughout the day to grab a cup of pre-scooped ice cream and a greeting. Some brought chairs and stayed for a couple of hours. It was such a relief to be with people and share something simple. It was a celebration of realized hope. I've built upon Latina feminist theologian Pilar Aquino's notion of empapamiento of hope and mujerista theologian Ada Maria Isacidias's notion of un poquito de justicia elsewhere. However, the last 20 months have made hope elusive for many. <laughs> 
I also do not wish to forget that the prior three years had made hope less tenable for many and that the storming of the capital of the USA and the US bishops raising so many questions around politicians being denied communion was the final breaking point for many Catholics. For many in the Americas and around the world, hope has been elusive at best and non-existent at worst for centuries. On that Saturday afternoon in June, Martin and I started planning our annual Oktoberfest. As things look so hopeful for large gatherings being a regular and safer option in our lives again after a, hi a hiatus last year. At the end of August, we had a serious conversation about what kind of risks we would be willing, we would be creating for loved ones, especially unvaccinated children, if we actually had the party. We decided not to hold the gathering this year, and as the usual day of the gathering, the last Saturday in September passed last week. I was sad that our house is not filled with tents and smells of sauerkraut, brats and pretzels. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> However, it was a day of realized hope that we had made a better decision. I'm finding that paying attention to realized hope in the face of so much suffering and death is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Realized hope means that the caretakers will see another day to continue their powerful protesting through Lamento Boliviano. Spirit of community. I find Professor Keenan to be spot on, yes, that's a highly technical term, when looking toward mutual vulnerability. I love a good story. I think the narratives and positioning of how mutuality is understood is incredibly important. I find the tiny details of a narrative to be the most intriguing. The brilliant Jonathan Vasquez recently posted a string of tweets on social media. Amazing how truth can arise on social media. Maybe not today. It's not just, that was for you, Rufus. It's not just for complaints and food porn. Well, the post is not his, but shared anonymously and is not comprised of a long manuscript with detailed citations. It stayed on my mind because of its rethinking the positionality and narrative. It states of a history professor speaking to a class, quote, Europeans came to the Americas because their civilizations were dirty, underdeveloped, starved, plagued, impoverished, and war-torn. The reality, they needed resources, refuge, and knowledge to support themselves, end quote. While mutual vulnerability is not about an exchange economy, it is about thinking deeply through our own positionality regarding systems. As 1 Corinthians 12, 25 to 27 states, quote, if one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. How many times have people needed to pay attention to the small details to care for the fragility of life? How many times have those small details been taken for granted by some among us who do not fight to announce and reclaim their human dignity daily? For those among us who will, not, who will lose employment or food if they have not attended to the smallest of details. For those among us who need to chose to remain vulnerable because forced vulnerability is not a daily reality of our lives. Despite all of the controversies of the motion picture version of In the Heights, did you guys watch that? I personally liked it, but I, I saw, yeah. A part of the movie stuck with me. When Abuela Claudia, brought out the hand-embroidered napkins and reflected upon so much work which had gone into them. Napkins, which someone was going to use to clean mess off their face and hands. Napkins, which many times I've just grabbed and crumpled. When asked why such care was taken to hand embroider, launder, and press the napkins to perfection, Abuela Claudia says, quote, 
We had to assert our dignity in small ways. That's why these napkins are beautiful. That's why my mother's gloves were beautiful. Little details that tell the world, we are not invisible, end quote. Abuela Claudia is reclaiming, announcing, shouting, clamoring that life and human dignity exist despite so much social sin working in opposition. Abuela Claudia draws attention to realized hope. It is when we think not only as individual agents, when we communally highlight the tiny details to reclaim human dignity shredded by social sin, that we begin working toward mutual vulnerability, I would argue. Might it be when we recognize how we all live in complex layers of chosen and forced vulnerability that we carry each other's compounded grief in a true pesame, me pesa, it weighs on me, I carry your grief with me. That we are breathing together. We conspire. We are spirit of community. Thank you. Can you hear me? You can. Wonderful. Thank you again so much to Jim Keenan and Naomi DeAnda for these incredible reflections. Um, there's so much to think about. And I'd like to uh, open the floor now for questions. There's a microphone right here, and you can go ahead and line up behind it with your questions. And um, Dr. Dan Scheid is sitting there in case you have any problems getting the mic to work. <laughs> First of all, thank you both for coming, and um, yes, very thought-provoking, instructive, valuable insights, um, eloquent, compelling. Uh, but the question I have for you is, to both uh, speakers, how do we put that eloquence, right? How do we put the, the life-giving, the co-creating, the hope in the face of death, the appreciating the present, the... Uh, all of that eloquence, um, realized hope, pay attention to small details, assert dignity in small ways. How do we put that in the play under the umbrella of vulnerability? How do we put this power of grief willing, as a willing openness to the loss of love into play via specific practices, actual practices, in the midst of a modern culture where it's necessary for generations young and old to harden their hearts, to deal with the influx of constant news that causes us grief, to universities that emphasize a need to be productive, and to those who may not have, as I think you allude, those who do not have the opportunity to be vulnerable, and they must not be vulnerable as a means to survive. <laughs> I think that might have been a tough question for deciding who's going to take it first. Yeah. Um. I don't know. Um, <laughs> as I said, I'm just trying to bring up, you know, like the thing that is striking me is my experience of grief is, as you said at the end, thinking about our positionality. My, my position in society, as I said at the end, I'm talking as a white man. Um, that's part of my, an older white man at that, uh, in the academy at that. Um, though I come from a very working class background, I have a deeply working class, and I've encountered bias in my own religious order because I come from that background. But um, I do think we need to find common themes 
that allow us to understand one another's vulnerability. And in that to encounter, um, to, to encounter one another. I, I just think we're very alienated. And I don't think that the alienation is going to become, Greg, ended by not being vulnerable. I, 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 I just think that vulnerability is the key. Um, I, I don't mean to invest it in a way that, you know, there's a Lisa Tessman in her Burden Virtues, you know, talks about, it's very nice for some people to talk about virtues when you have all the positionality that you have and you don't appreciate what it's like for others. I think that's very, very true. But I do think we also need to um, be honest and um, be vulnerable, which also means, like for me, to be open to critique, um, to be open to, uh, to, to be exposed. I mean, that's why I did this. It would be easier if I wrote on some, I love writing on history, it's great. You keep writing about history, everybody thinks you're brilliant. It's, it's fine, but have I done anything? I mean, I have respect for historians, I invest myself on it, but I do think that um, making yourself, I think when faculty make themselves vulnerable, it's a lesson to, to students. I, it's very hard to do, but I think that these things need to be done. Um, so that, that's just a stab at it. I, I think it's somehow exposing, not, not in a narcissistic way, in, in, in a way of trying to relinquish and say, come what may, this is what I think. I also do not know. Can you understand me through the mask? I'm under some regulations that I'm not allowed to take this mask off. Um, so, but as long as you can understand me. I, I think it's really important to say we do not know. I think we're living through magnificent, marvelous, terrible times. And to live fully through magnificent, marvelous, terrible times means that we all need to put our best thinking forward because we've never been here before. So while well, I have gotten the privilege of doing this for so many years now, to study and to read and, and to work in so many different communities, I still do not know. And so I, I do think that part of the vulnerability is to expose ourselves in saying that and to say, sometimes I need to step aside and let you all, everyone here, all of our students start doing much more thinking. Everyone here has lived a good decade at least of life, if not two or five or eight. And so I think it's important that we recognize that and say the experts don't have all the answers, but the experts can somewhat guide and sometimes the experts just want some coffee and a nap. So first, I would like to reiterate what he said about all of this was very insightful, and I'm glad that you both came to speak about this. Also, thank you, Dr. Scheid. I believe I'm speaking for all of my classmates in your ethics class when I say thank you for making me come to this lecture. <laughs> um, but um, my question is for Dr. Keenan. So in your discussion of the parable of the Good Samaritan, you stated that it was the Samaritan's vulnerability that allowed him to recognize the man lying by the side of the road and recognize that he, he needed help. And then it was his conscience that stepped in and allowed him to give that man aid. So my question is, therefore, if an animal were to display those same traits, if it were to see another of its kind injured, in danger, and give aid to that other animal, would it be considered that that other animal then could possibly be vulnerable and possess a conscience? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Big yes. <laughs> a very big yes. I mean, I, we, we see this all the time. 
um, that, but that there is an expression of vulnerability that's, that's part of nature. It's there all the time. You can't hear me? Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I just think that that's, that's very true. Um, yeah. Hi. I also just want to say thank you to everyone that put this together as well and for you two for coming to speak. Um, my question was specifically also to Dr. Kanan, but both of you really touched on it. Um, I want to know what it looks like for you in your life to kind of believe in this twofold of God that is both all-powerful and vulnerable um, in the way that uh, he mourns with us. You're going to say something. Do you want me to say something first? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, you don't have to say it first. But oh. Okay. Well, we to <laughs> we're, we're thinking this is actually what we're doing here. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever you want. Uh, so I think there's two ways I can answer that question. One, I'm not sure I believe in the all-powerful God. Oh my gosh, I'm exposing myself there. Um, so I think that's a, a big, important piece. But two, I think because we have a Trinitarian model of God that is at least three persons, I can give you a lecture on Guadalupe that's separate, or Mary, and why there's at least three persons in the Trinity. But um, for now, there's, at least, there's three persons in the Trinity. And we believe that the second person of the Trinity became incarnate, fully vulnerable, which opens up that all-powerful God to the vulnerability. So there's the like, constructive systematic answer but if you're asking me, I, I'm not sure I can believe in an all-powerful God in a world that suffers so much. And we, we may want to do that, too. We may want to do that. But I, too, I find it so important to be thinking of God's vulnerability. You know, um, like, this is, I don't know, but... Think of uh, where is God on the death of Jesus on the cross? You know, Sabrina tells us we need to consider Christ on the cross. Where, where, where is God? And I think that that's really key. Um, is God weeping? Um, where's the intervention? Like, and, and I think that the more you live life, the less um, disposed you are to easy and classic answers. And, and the more you, you realize that you, you need to hear or you want to pay attention to what experience teaches rather than to what others have been communicating to you. So I think it's really key to, um, you know, I know in my own life, um, I couldn't understand why my brother Bobby choked to death or, or, or why my best friend had collapse in a hallway and nobody knew he was even there, you know. But that, that's just, we all have these stories. How, how do we have a faith that communicates those stories? That's what I was trying to get to the upper room. I think we all need to get to the upper room. I, we need to talk grievously about the human condition instead of convincingly. That, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to expose us all to give up all the false icons that convince us that this is faith and, and instead answer the, enter the faith of Mary Magdalene or, or a, enter the faith of the others in the scriptures who, who help us to um, see life in its simple difficulties. So first of all, thank you uh, for being here and for presenting and provoking. Uh, thanks to the university for doing this every year because I get fed at least once a year, and I appreciate that. Um, something that kind of, I have a very busy mind, so I'm going to try to pull these 
like points together, but the gentleman who spoke and said, so what of all this, right? You know, what, what is the takeaway this year in this discussion of vulnerability and recognition and conscience? And something that started clicking for me was <clears throat> testimony, that accompaniment, the word accompaniment came up two to three times, and then in the first presentation, testimony, right? Our narrative, our personal experience and story. Um, that's a moment of vulnerability to stand up and to testify. Here, here is my story. I'm going to put myself out there. Um, our vulnerable God, the word incarnate, right? The word, our sacred story, this is, this is part of it. And as someone who was raised within a Roman Catholic tradition, where do we gather most regularly was in worship, was in liturgy, which was always a very, very rigidly structured um, experience, shared experience. Who gets to talk? Who doesn't get to talk? What do you get to say? Um, and I wonder if that isn't a place where we need to go in our perspective faith traditions to begin breaking things down a bit and allowing for more testimony, more conversation about who we are and, and what we struggle with and what we have to offer. Um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just stop there. But, but I think we, we need maybe to practice first and break down some of our fears. Um, and then, you know, the, the liturgy never ends, right? Go in peace. You know, so we practice together being vulnerable, and then we continue to worship by reaching out to our neighbors um, and, and accompany one another. I, I just want to, you know, invite people to consider those in the upper room. You know, when they left the upper room, they were still grieving. That, that, that to me, I think is really important. They weren't like everything wasn't solved. But we, we teach, we, we, we actually have reconstructed the upper room as being a place where the spirit came down and then they came running out and everything was fine. But we don't pay attention to, you know, what I say, the Magdalene is waiting for the embrace. It, is, it hasn't happened. The nole me tangere, it was once in our tradition. We've lost it. You know, we have to get to, to human longing. And we have to get to the fact that our scriptures witness to that. But we haven't recognized that. And it, we're only recognize it if we're vulnerable to the scriptures, to the questions that are there, rather than to, you know, the solutions, which is, I think, what the, your question was about, you know, God, giving. And as you said, structures, the structures we have that censure the capability for having the discussions that are vulnerable and that can deal with grief, the grievous, Human, what did you call it? You called it oh, that wonderful thing you said. Um, there were several, so many. Um, we live in marv magnificent, marvelous, terrible, terrible, terrible times. times. That's what we live in, for God's sakes. <laughs> I, I, I do also wonder about what the last 20 months have done and and how is it that we need to rethink about or how have people been reconfiguring worship? I love your notion of practice first and practice in fear or practice out of that fear. Uh, one, keep working on that. Two, uh, I, I think it's important to look at how people have dealt with the last 20 months, because I think that there's been a whole lot of work of the spirit. And 
many people just want to go back to quote unquote normal without listening to what may be out there that's new and different and and moving and are, are there people gathering on Zoom to do liturgy and have shared homilies? I know they are. Mm. Uh, are there small faith communities gathering far more often than they were before because the churches were closed or because they don't feel comfortable going back with the differences of the mask mandates or how people wear their masks or how vulnerable they are okay with making themselves and others. And so I, I, I think it's really important to pay attention to all of those things. Well, we have run out of time, friends. Um, and I want to thank those of you who asked a question, especially the students who made themselves vulnerable. Well done. I want to um, thank the provost for being with us this evening. I want to um, welcome and thank our colloquists who will spend tomorrow talking about all of these themes. I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank my department, um, including many of my colleagues here in the room, for their support as I put together this, uh, this show <laughs> this evening. And I want to invite you all to take some time to continue the conversation both of these folks are very nice, <laughs> very personable, and would be happy to be introduced to you or have you introduce yourself, um, ask your questions, and have some food with us next door in the Shepherson Suite. Um, finally, one more time, let's thank our speakers. <laughs>